When you picture transatlantic service, you probably picture something like this, maybe something like this, or maybe even something like this. But what if I told you my new favorite way to cross the Atlantic looked something more like this? Welcome to Paris Charles de Gaulle. We're hopping on board one of JetBlue's new services from Paris all the way up to New York. It's an eight and a half hour flight, and today we're going to be traveling in the very special Mint Studio Suite on JetBlue and trying out that experience. With about 10 to 20 flights per day between New York and Paris, it's a definite market that JetBlue wanted to tap into, and I'm excited to see how they take advantage of it. Our journey today starts at the Sheraton, located right inside Paris Charles de Gaulle's Terminal 2. It basically dumps you out right where the transit hub drops you out as well, and so from there it's a pretty easy walk to wherever you need to get within Terminal 2, so you can get some steps in before getting on board your flight. For us, off to 2B. The setup of the terminals here is a little bit funky, just because we're going to have to walk through 2D to reach our terminal of 2B. Luckily, still not too long of a walk. Luckily, not too early of a departure, as the sun had begun to come up, so we were able to get a good view of the early morning arrivals and departures from Paris Charles de Gaulle. As we walk through the newly renovated check-in areas of Terminals 2B and D, we see a lot of the airlines that are based there. Terminals 2B and D are largely used for One World carriers, in addition to some other random airlines like Air Tahiti Nui, Air Algerie, Air Canada, and our airline today, JetBlue, amongst some others. And once I'd walked as far as I possibly could walk before hitting a dead end, I finally reached the end of Terminal 2B, where the check-in counters are at JetBlue. I headed outside to get a view of the external part of the terminal, which is where I realized that you can leave the terminal in a few different places. However, you do have to enter here at the center hub. So we walked back over to the center hub while I waited for the JetBlue counters to open. One thing I found interesting is that instead of parallel parking and dropping people off, there were actually permanent parking spots here located at the curb. Not for long-term parking, but if you just had to drop someone off, you were able to pull in, park, say goodbye to that person, then get back in your car and drive off. Something that would never pass by American airport standards. Now because of how new this flight is, there's no real posting about how early the check-in counters open for JetBlue. So as usual, when flying on a long-haul business class flight, I showed up about four hours early which gives me plenty of time to enjoy the airport without feeling rushed whatsoever. Especially because coming into Paris, I was held up for a long time at immigration and I didn't want to risk that on my outbound immigration. I found out, however, that the JetBlue counters didn't open until three hours before departure, so I posted up at a bench, waited for the check-in counters to open, while I longed for that extra hour of sleep that I could have gotten. It wasn't long before I was waved up to join the check-in queue, and since I had been waiting around, no surprise, I was the first person to check in at the counter that day. Before long, I had my bag checked in, and I had my boarding pass in hand, clearly labeled as a JetBlue Mint customer. Very exciting, as this was my first time trying out any variation of their product. Now, I personally think that JetBlue might be my favorite airline in the United States, largely because of their onboard product. They offer a great selection of TV shows and movies on the Seatback Entertainment screen, and they offer some great food and drink beverages on the Seatback TV as well. So I was really excited to see what their long haul and specifically business class was like. For starters, there was no special security or immigration for business class passengers on JetBlue. You just joined the normal queue, went up the escalators, and joined the normal security line. Luckily, this early in the morning, Terminal 2B wasn't too busy and I was able to get through security and out into the terminal in about 15 to 20 minutes. Once through security, it's just a quick escalator ride back down a floor where you head through the duty-free shop and out into the main part of the terminal here. Now this is the central hub for airlines departing from terminals 2D and 2B. Now for those international flights, there is an immigration stand that you have to pass through. However, this central hub allows you to hang out, get some food and shopping done before passing through that outbound immigration. To make it easy to find everything, they do have the departure boards up on top, and just below that they have an interactive map where you can just scan your boarding pass and it'll show you exactly where you need to go for your flight. 
So with that being scanned, it was time to head off to the area of Terminal 2B that housed my gate today for JetBlue. Now I did mention that there was outbound immigration to pass through, and by no means is it as bad as the inbound immigration. Unfortunately, there is no priority lane for JetBlue business class passengers, but as the inbound immigration took a little over 2 hours, the outbound immigration only took a little over 15 to 20 minutes. Now as we're into the terminal now, I will say Paris Charles de Gaulle gets kind of a bad rap, partially because of the strange terminal arrangement, partially because of some of the delays that you face when you're here, and partially just because of that immigration that can take forever. However, now that I'm out in 2B, in my first time ever in Paris Charles de Gaulle, I will say that this may be one of my favorite looking terminals that I have ever come across in my travels. Not only was the experience welcoming and calming based on this early morning piano by this guy that I can't tell if he was here specifically to play the piano or if he was just a passenger and the piano just happened to be open for anyone to play. In addition to that, some of the signage and the wood paneling on the walls gave the terminal some great accents that contrasted the red seats and the red carpet beautifully in my opinion. The circle windows up on the ceiling were a great little touch as they were not totally noticeable but they definitely added that accent to the terminal and the seating areas that carried throughout with the wonderful chandeliers and sweeping views of the ramp were beautiful. In addition, because there was only about 10 gates, there was one restaurant, one bathroom, and a souvenir shop, it only took about 30 to 45 minutes from check-in to the gate, so you could probably get away with arriving about an hour and a half before your flight. This is also about when I noticed that not only is there plenty of seating here in 2B, but the seating is pretty comfortable, and all these seats for the most part have multiple charging outlets, meaning that you're not trying to hunt down that one seat that happens to be near a charging outlet. There is one major drawback to JetBlue's business class cabin on these transatlantic flights, and that is that there is no lounges. This is to no fault of Paris Charles de Gaulle, as none of their airports have lounges, not even their main hubs of Boston and New York, which meant that I had to find some places to get comfortable. Luckily, as I mentioned, this terminal had plenty of places to relax and wait for a flight. Being in Paris, of course, however, I was able to get that trademark breakfast here. I was able to go to the refrigerator and stock up on the cold items that I wanted, put them in a basket, and then when I got to the front of the line I could order my hot items before going to sit in their main dining area with a friend that I made while I was here in the airport that was actually going to be getting on board the Air Canada flight out to Montreal. Eat and drink with caution though because the one restroom is so small that men and women were using both sides and if we assume that each of these flights is departing full that means there's about 1500 to 2000 people sharing this one restroom. Now this part of Paris Charles de Gaulle isn't home to a ton of airlines so I just enjoyed what airplanes I could see while I waited here and walked around including this Air Canada 777 coming in from Montreal, making a quick turn back out to Montreal, this Air Astral aircraft that, as far as I could tell, was just repositioning to a slightly different gate, these Royal Jordanian airplanes, there was about two or three of them that taxied by in my time here, an Air Belgium A330 that had come in from Africa, and then also a Concorde off in the distance. We also had a view of what seemed to be some sort of Air France offices. Right next to that was also a nice Air France looking obelisk sphere. Now even though there was no lounge, there was still a couple things to do here in this terminal. First off, there was a couple different foosball tables, so if you wanted to just play a quick game of foosball, you could do that in any of these main seating areas. In addition to that, there was no shortage of PS5s scattered around the terminal as well. So if you did want to play some games, you could play, there was two controllers for each console here set up with these TVs. All you had to do was walk up and pick your game. They had a couple different choices, however, the main one I saw people playing, of course, was FIFA. Now we did have a gate change, largely because our aircraft, surprise surprise, departed two hours late from JFK. They did actually board only about an hour behind schedule, partially because they made up some of that time in the air, but mostly because the benefit of crossing the ocean in a narrow body is that they're much quicker to deplane, clean, and get ready for that next flight, especially when they are late. Before long, however, though, we did see our plane rolling in past the Concorde, approaching our gate here at Bravo 21. JetBlue boards in groups offering their priority customers, their highest mosaic status members, and their mint customers priority boarding, and then followed by groups A through F. 
They invited us to queue while we waited for boarding to commence, and so that way, since we were departing slightly late, they could get as early of a departure as possible as soon as we were ready to get on board. And as we approached my A321 titled Mint the Gap, I was very excited to step on board and see this mint product for my very first time. I welcome you to the absolutely stunning A321 on JetBlue's mint service. We will be in seat 1A today, which is one of JetBlue's mint studio suites as opposed to the just mint suites. Only the seats in row 1 are mint studio suites. Because there's no seat in front of it, the suites are slightly larger, can accommodate two people when in cruise, and have a lot more space and amenities as compared to the other seats. This does come at a higher cost of an extra $250 per seat. With my pre-departure mimosa in hand, it was time to take a quick look around what the seat had to offer. First things first, directly inside the door is one of two mood lamps that you have inside your suite. Directly below that is where you have the handle to release the suite door, although they didn't unlock that until after departure. In addition, you have this large countertop immediately adjacent to that, where I was able to store things like my drinks and laptop and whatnot once we were in flight. You'll also find a headset plug, a universal charging port, and a USB charging port located there. In addition to this little thing that looked like it could wrap up cords or something, but I never found a use for it. You also have a tray table here that comes out with the push of a button to pop out in front of you. It doesn't slide forward and backwards very well, and so it kind of sits in that one main position, but it can fold up if you do need space to get out while you're eating. Below that, we find the Seatback TV remote and two shortcut buttons to control the seat, one for fully sitting and one for fully lying. Admittedly, the Seatback TV remote was a little bit outdated of a look compared to the rest of the cabin. Considering this plane was only a few months old, I was surprising to see this style of remote at the seat. Although, I guess as long as it can control the Seatback TV remote, anything's fine. In addition, down there is where you're going to find the literature pocket, where I had not one, but two identical safety cards for this aircraft. Moving around the seat, over your shoulder you've got this reading light that can pop up in addition to the overhead reading light. Below that is where you have the seat controls where you can adjust each piece individually, use the shortcuts, it also includes a do not disturb button and a mood lighting adjustment. I will add that the seat shell is this plush and cushiony type of surface, which made it an extra comfortable suite but also helped a little bit with noise reduction as well. Now for the seat itself, it was actually a pretty wide seat, very comfortable, made even wider if you're in the Mint Studio suite by having that entire bench to your right. There was also a fully stocked bedding and amenity kit that came with the seat as well. As mentioned, you'll see the bench here immediately to your left where you can stretch out or if you have someone else traveling with you, they can sit there once you're up in the air. To your left, on the other counter, you'll first off see the wireless charging port where you can rest your device to get it fully charged. Adjacent to that is where you're going to find this little cubby. Inside there, we found it stocked with a water bottle and also a large storage cubby that I chose not to use just because I didn't want to risk accidentally leaving anything behind. In front of me on the bulkhead was yet another reading light. I was able to use this as another accent light, and you'll see how that was adjustable once we get in flight. I also had my own personal little seatbelt sign and no smoking sign on the bulkhead in front of me. And if you do end up having a passenger join you in the Mint Studio in flight, not to worry because they have their own tray table here they can pull out with just a little bit of force, and so once you're in flight and those meals are being served, you each have plenty of space. Also on the bulkhead adjacent to the TV is where you find this little locker. Inside that locker, once you open it up, was a couple things, including some amenities like the in-flight headphones and the slippers, in addition to having a little mirror as well. Underneath that was another universal charging port and USB-C charging port. So if you do have a partner in there with you, you each have your own charging ports to use for your devices. Immediately in front of you is where you find the Seatback TV. It's a very nice size and is tucked into the wall but can be pulled out very easily. 
underneath that is another spot with a little bit of storage. No lack of storage in this seat, but unfortunately I was more afraid of losing things that I kept in all these little cubbies. Immediately under that is where we find the footwell that turns into the foot part of the bed when put in the full relaxed mode. And of course, you guys always know that I'm a sucker for those individual air vents. Of course, the A321 has one at each seat. And here you can see the little ramp that gets you from the aisle up into your suite. Now looking through the amenities, of course starting off with my mimosa that I used to start my flight. Following up that, looking at the headphones, the master and dynamic noise cancelling headphones designed specifically for JetBlue Mint. Some of the best, most comfortable, and best noise cancelling headphones I've ever used. Unfortunately, they were just a little bit heavy. We were also given these slippers. These were actually some of the most comfortable slippers I've ever used as they came with a nice little memory foam sole on the bottom of it. The only problem is they were pretty big and even for my size 11 feet, they were a little bit large for me. This was the amenity kit that comes here in the JetBlue Mint Suite. Not the most inclusive amenity kit, however they don't have many long haul flights so it's not the end of the world. You can see it comes with a few things inside of it. Those things include an eye mask, a toothbrush with a single use toothpaste, and some earplugs. In addition to the seat being comfortable, there was no lack of comfort from the additional amenities like this decorative pillow. We were also given a packet with all of the bedding including comforters and pillows. First things first was this memory foam pillow that I thought was personally one of the most comfortable and substantial pillows that I've ever gotten on an airplane. I didn't end up sleeping on this flight, but had I decided to sleep, this pillow would have made it very enjoyable. Then came the main comforter. Now all of these amenities come from Tuft and Needle and their comforter was very comfortable. It was somewhat thin, but I found it to be very warming. The best part, however, was you can see all of these different ways that you can organize it for a foot nook, a sleep shawl, or a rest vest, as they like to call it. Love the names, love the design even more, as you can see there's all these little buttons on here. You can use those buttons to hook it up in different spots to hook your feet in, hook your body in, or you can leave them all unbuckled and it's just one big comforter. And as we get comfy and ready for pushback, it's time for the slippers. Then it was time to look through the menu brought to us by New York's own Charlie Bird. It was also a nice touch to have each of the flight attendants name on it so that we could see who was going to be helping us out on this flight. Taking a look, we were going to have about a meal and a half. After departure, we were given a proper breakfast, there were some mid-flight snacks, and we also had a smaller meal just before arrival. The back of the menu just had a little bit more information about who Charlie Bird was and the food that he was going to be serving on this flight. The insert that came with the menu also included one side that had some wines, and the other side had some of their cocktails, including their signature cocktails and mocktails as well. Now as we taxi out, just a couple notes about my thoughts on these narrow body operated long haul flights that are popping up around the world. Now as far as JetBlue goes specifically, so far everything's been incredible. The seat has never been more comfortable on an airplane, the crew has been fantastic, and as far as my past flights on JetBlue have gone, I have high expectations for what to expect once we get up in the air, so I'm excited to try that out. However, this is a fully daytime flight and so I didn't really have a need to sleep, I just wanted to be comfortable and get my way to New York. However. If you were to take this flight in reverse, or their other current transatlantic services to London or their upcoming service to Amsterdam, you're going to find yourself on a red eye. Now if I were to fly from my home airport of San Francisco to Europe, I'd expect about 10 to 12 hours of sleep and I'd arrive well rested even if I didn't get a full night of sleep along the way given meal services and whatnot. If I were taking this service from New York to Paris, however, it's only about a 6 hour flight. You figure you're going to have takeoff and landing where they're going to have to have you sitting upright and then there's meal services where even if you decide to sleep, there's still going to be activity around you in the cabin and it can be kind of tough to sleep. That's the only problem that I really see with these new narrow body long haul flights is that the range of these aircraft is limited. Therefore, they can't fly forever and so the routes are only so long and so if you do have a red eye, the flight length is just a little bit short in my opinion where you can't get a full night of sleep even if you decide to forego all of the meal services on board. I am curious about your guys' thoughts on this. However, what I will say, the biggest benefit of these new routes is that because you can operate into these new narrow body aircraft on these long haul routes, it opens up a lot of untapped markets that would not have been served otherwise. So all in all, I guess there's pluses and minuses to everything, but I'm curious what you guys think about this.
Now they're in the air, it's time to take a look through the in-flight entertainment system here on JetBlue's aircraft, which first off, greeted me by name, as long as you're in your assigned seat, you're going to have this feature. It also gives you the opportunity to pair your device to use as another remote control for the TV. You can also do this later if you can't do it at this time. Here's possibly my favorite feature, however, is that if you're traveling in Mint, it gives you the opportunity to pre-order your meals. Where some airlines would have flight attendants coming through the aisles to take your order, this instead gives you the option to make your order directly here on the TV. It pulls up each of the meals that will be served on this flight. You can choose either a quick service or a full service, and then you add all of your small plates, your sides, and your main plates, and you're able to create exactly what dish it is that you want to eat for each of your meals. The flight attendants do still come through the aisle, so if you do want to make any customizations to it or you have any allergies, you can address that with them, and they are also happy to take your order for you. However, it is a wonderful touch to be able to just do this all on your seatback TV, have it all done and taken care of, and something that I haven't really seen on any other other airlines in the world. Once that was finished up, we reached our home menu here, where it greeted me by name and also addressed my destination. Now the in-flight entertainment is where I truly feel JetBlue thrives. You can see from your home menu, you can scroll not only over, but also down to reach a number of selections to help you find exactly what type of entertainment you'd like to watch on your flight. Stuff that most airlines don't offer, and it gives you a great selection for whoever you may be. For example, you have live TV, which has kind of been falling by the wayside and hasn't been found on most airplanes these days, even though about 10 years ago it was kind of the norm. If you watch my Vistara video from last week, you'll know that the live TV was also available on Vistara, and I was equally as surprised to see it there. In addition, there's also a page here that has everything about your destination. At this point, it was talking about our expected arrival gate and baggage claim, and if you were making connections, it would help you find those flights and how to connect to those flights. In addition was the directions on how to connect to their free in-flight Wi-Fi service, which we will take a look at shortly after the in-flight entertainment system. Now when it comes to the entertainment itself, you can see here looking at the movies first. Under movies, there's a number of categories, or you can just scroll down and see all of the movies one after the other, where the list just seems to go on and on and on. Interesting, considering that the majority of JetBlue's network is all domestic, and so it's not the longest flights in the world, and so you wouldn't even have time to watch these. What that means to me is that frequent flyers on JetBlue can continue to fly without ever running out of things to watch. For example, however, just looking at the comedy section alone, you can see just how many selections there are. And of course, as is always my favorite, if you do find something you like, you can go ahead, like it, and add it to your favorites, making it easier to find later, as that's the only frustrating thing about these big selections, is that it's easy to lose things that you want to watch. TV shows were more of the same, like the movies, where you can see there's a large number of categories, or you can scroll down and see all of the different options. In addition, if you do want to find a specific genre, it's pretty easy to use the Show Me tab and find that specific genre. One of the best things, however, is that on a large majority of the TV shows they offer, they have full seasons, as sometimes it's somewhat frustrating when you are watching a show on an airplane and they only have a few random episodes from throughout the series, where you can see here Young Sheldon, there's like 20-something episodes in a row, and you can add all of those to your favorites, just like the movies. There honestly wasn't a ton of games, however, I did definitely enjoy a good round of Battleship. After that was where we found some more informational stuff about JetBlue and less entertainment. For example here you can see some stuff about TrueBlue which is their frequent flyer program and the different perks that come with the different levels of that TrueBlue system. This was followed by a digital look through their menu which included both the eastbound and westbound options so I was able to take a look at some of the different options that were available on flights that maybe weren't exactly this one. After that, you'll find a few categories of different movies and TV shows that specifically fell under certain categories. So for example, we had the Endless Summer picks, we had the Patriotic picks, all kinds of stuff like this that you could use specific categories. Specifically, they had one of French films since this was just after the launch of this new French route and they wanted to sponsor that. One of my favorite things, however, is that they do have categories like movies for short flights and movies for long flights so that you don't run out of time if you do want to watch something. They also had a category here for Open Meditations, which is a sponsorship they've worked with to give different meditations to either help you sleep or just help you relax while you're on board your flight. 
in addition and something I found pretty interesting is that they have a lot of their different destinations here in their audio for travel. What you were able to do is click on any of these destinations and under that was a menu of different things to see and do and you could watch and listen to all different things about those sites. So if you're going to a site that you've never seen before, you can get a little bit of background information on it. Since there is no seatback literature, they do put most of that on the seatback TV. For example, you can take a look here through their route map and all the destinations that they fly to. They also had a short survey that I was happy to take to let JetBlue and the crew know that I appreciated everything that they did on this flight. Now when it comes to the map for your flight, there's a couple different options. First off, by tapping on the progress bar up top, you're able to get a quick snapshot of how far along you are. From there, you can open up a picture-in-picture -picture mode of your map to get a little snapshot of where you are visually over the ground. But if you're looking for an entire map, that's a pretty easy thing as all you have to do is come down here and click on the little icon pulling up your full page map. This map is completely interactive, can be zoomed, rotated, and all kinds of stuff, and you can search additional cities. This has been popping up on more and more different airlines and it's definitely my favorite type of map that you could find on your Seatback TV. Then I wanted to take a look through JetBlue's FlyFi, which is what they call their free onboard Wi-Fi system. And yes, you heard that correctly, it is completely free. After logging in as a guest, I was connected to the Wi-Fi. Simple as that. You can also create accounts so that you can continuously connect if you're a frequent JetBlue flyer. From here, I wanted to connect my in-flight entertainment remote so I could use my phone throughout the flight. The process was simple as I just hit pair your device, typed in the code on my Seatback TV screen, and once that was done I was presented with this quick little four function remote that I was able to use while relaxed in my seat. They also had plenty of information about the flight, including a bunch of stuff as far as what would be found on board, mostly including food and drinks, but also including things for purchase that you could use to get comfortable for sleep, and some of the movies and TV offerings that they were currently sponsoring at the moment. So lastly, there's only one thing left to do, and that was check the speed. The Wi-Fi that we had on board was fast. Impressive for any Wi-Fi, especially a free Wi-Fi. Only one thing left to do, and that was check out the custom playlist that was on the back of the menu card that we were handed out. By scanning that, it took us to a Spotify playlist where we could see an array of songs that they had set to their preset JetBlue onboard playlist. It was almost meal time, but before we got served the first meal that we had ordered, we started off with a simple coffee and pastry. This is where perhaps the best thing about flying JetBlue comes into play. No matter what cabin class you're flying in, you're given Dunkin' Donuts coffee. And as we all know, America runs on Dunkin'. Then I was excited to have my breakfast. Super excited because I had never talked to anyone about this. All I did was order it on my TV and it showed up. Included in that breakfast was this avocado toast, which mostly had bruschetta type sticks to dip into the avocado balsamic. It came with an assortment of berries, both strawberries and raspberries. And then it came with this Greek yogurt as well. Those were mostly the sides. And then the main protein that came with the meal was this sausage that also came with some chili oil on the side of it. And as always, we always have to look for the specific airline branding. JetBlue doesn't carve theirs in, but it is labeled on the back of each piece of silverware. So while I sat back and enjoyed my meal, I got very comfortable and started watching The Sandlot while I settled in for the seven and a half hour flight back to New York. By this time of the flight, you also could have had someone come up and join you if you were traveling with someone else in the mint cabin. You can see here that even though the tray tables aren't individually that big, you do have plenty of space for each of you to have your own tray table to eat your meal. And I'm sorry y'all, but I think this may be the most photogenic cabin I've ever seen on an airplane. It didn't matter whether it was light or dark, every angle just seemed to turn out beautiful, especially those wonderful detail accent lights on the ceiling. They were drowned out a little bit by some of the economy passengers with their windows open until a little bit later in the flight, unfortunately. Then it was time for one of the most exciting things on airplanes these days, and that's closing the door. With this little switch here, you can close the door, and you can see from the inside and the outside, it offers plenty of privacy. 
In addition, it's not only the Mint Studio Suites that have these closed doors, as every Mint Suite on this aircraft has the same closing doors for privacy. Now JetBlue is not alone in this, but one of the drawbacks with a lot of these closed door suites is they don't close all the way. You can see there's a couple inches here of opening on the side and about six inches of opening underneath the suite. That's pretty common to find on pretty much any of these airlines with a closed door. Breakfast wrapped up with a seltzer water for me and with that it was time to take a look through the different seat modes that were offered here. Obviously you can adjust each piece individually or use the presets. Now for takeoff and landing, you've seen this shot now a couple of times, you can see how both the bench and the seat itself are set up here with plenty of leg room for you. From there here, you can hold the relax setting and you'll see both the seat and eventually the bench start to move to give you a very comfortable spot to watch movies, although I actually recline myself a little bit more to get myself a little extra comfortable. And now it was time to check out what might be my new favorite bed in the sky. Now you do have to hold these down in order to get them to progress through the stages, but you'll see that not only the main seat but the bench recline to create a ginormous surface to be entirely comfortable for sleep. You can see here you have almost the entire surface of your Mint Studio covered with cushion, and like I've mentioned, it's one of the most comfortable seats I've ever used, so plenty comfortable to sleep in. In addition, once you lay the blankets out, both pillows combined give you any amount of comfort that you're looking for, and the blanket does cover pretty much the entire suite. You can see here with that closed door, the amount of privacy and comfort you could get. If I could spend 20 hours in this bed, I 100% would. I mean, as far as the available space while you're sleeping in this bed, the only thing that could rival this amount of space would be Emirates First Class. You can see here that if you wanna sleep with your legs straight ahead, you have all that room, or you can sleep at an angle on your side, front, back, wherever you decide to be, there's more than enough space for you to get comfortable and get plenty of sleep. You also, like most airlines, have a do not disturb button if you are trying to get some sleep. All that really does outside your suite is change your green mint leaf to just a blue mint leaf instead. To help get yourself comfortable, you can turn the mood lighting up or down. There's also the button on the far left. What I found out that that does is it changes the mood lighting from a yellowish white to more of that blue color. Every time you hit it, it swaps which light is white and which light is blue. What you're seeing here is the moment of regret while I'm super comfortable in the seat and wishing that I could be in it for infinitely longer. In the meantime, however, I wanted to check out one of the non-Mint Studio Suites and instead just one of the normal Mint Suites as there was a couple empty seats so the flight attendants let me take one of them for the time being to get a little bit of content for you. 2F, for example, here on the right side is one of the normal Mint seats. So if you're booking the normal Mint price and don't want to pay the $250 extra, dollars, this is what you're going to get. What you'll find is that you still have a closed door suite, and in my opinion, you still have plenty of legroom to be comfortable. The only drawback is you don't have that extra cushion to the side to act as extra room for you or someone you might be traveling with. You still have the same details around the suite as far as the mood lighting goes and the different textures they have on the walls and seat shell, and a different coat hook on the back there. You'll see the counter to your left serves similar to the counter to the right on my suite, of and it's roughly the same size and with the same size tray table. In front of you, you have another footrest, room underneath that footrest, and still plenty of storage. In addition to the right side, having more storage, more charging in addition to the wireless charging, including this extra little cubby here that could store any devices or whatever you might not be needing at the current moment. So it might not have exactly the space of the Mint Studio, but I think this is plenty for a transatlantic flight. So what I've decided is whether you want to pay the extra $250 for the Mint Studio or not, this is in my opinion the best way to cross the Atlantic. Now to take a look at the lavatories in JetBlue, starting off with the decals on the wall making it somewhat unique and the fake concrete look that they go through on the floor. The bathroom is almost entirely touchless as well as you can wave your hand here to get the toilet to flush. When it comes time to throw things out, all you have to do is put your hand near the garbage chute and it opens up. And obviously when you want to wash your hands, all you have to do is put your hands underneath the faucet to get the water out. 
So as we finally made our way across the ocean, I decided to start off my mid-flight snack with just a nice little green tea. They also came through the aisles shortly thereafter with a basket full of snacks, so I chose a couple of things that would nicely complement my green tea while I sat back and watched my movie. And way too soon, we were about an hour and a half from arrival into JFK, meaning that it was time for our last meal service of the flight. Funnily enough, I had forgotten what I had ordered by this point, so it was kind of a surprise when it showed up. What this meal came with was a croque monsieur sandwich. Alongside that came a nice little small modest salad. They also gave us a little candy bar to go along with that that I saved for later, and a little piece of bread that I once again was too full for and decided to save for later as well. By this point of the flight, I had finally figured out how to take full advantage of the comfortability of this seat, stretching out across not only my seat, but also the partner seat directly adjacent. Of course, this was also the time that I noticed that we were finally seeing the east coast of the United States, meaning that pretty much as soon as I had finally gotten fully comfortable, it was time to prepare for landing. As we began for our descent, they came through with these scented towels here with lemon essential oils, a great little way to wrap up this wonderful flight. Now our arrival here to New York took us from the north, meaning that we were able to see the east coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island before making our final cut across Block Island and down across Long Island. Now that we're on the ground, it's time for the final thoughts on the JetBlue Mint Studio Suites on their new transatlantic service from Paris Charles de Gaulle to New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, currently the longest flight in the JetBlue network. I don't think there's any surprise, based on the comments I've had on this video and based on whatever this title will end up being, that this might be one of the favorite flights of mine that I have ever been on. I think, personally, it's the best way that one could cross the Atlantic. I think what JetBlue's got here with the Mint Studio Suites is fantastic. Even the Mint Suites themselves on their new A320neos are absolutely some of the most comfortable seats and best amenities that I've seen on board a flight. 
I'd say the only drawback that you have with this is that because it's a narrow body aircraft, it's just limited as to how far the range could fly. So for a daytime flight, it was plenty comfortable. I'm just not quite sure on a red eye that I'd be able to get a full night of sleep as long as I would have liked to if I were in a proper bed. Looking past that, however, the seat itself was one of the best seats I've ever sat in. The food was incredible, and especially being able to order it directly from the Seatback TV was one of the greatest touches I've ever seen on an airplane, never seen it in any other airlines either. In addition to that, the crew was fantastic, and the in-flight entertainment system that JetBlue offers is top-notch, definitely one of my favorite in-flight entertainment systems as it gives you so much stuff to sort through. In addition to that, having free in-flight Wi-Fi is fantastic. I've really loved seeing more and more airlines incorporate this into their services. Things like United and Delta have started doing, and as well as Singapore Airlines has looked into adding the free in-flight Wi-Fi as well. It's just a great way to offer all of your passengers the ability to connect to in-flight entertainment since the cost to supply it has been going down, and that way, no matter how much you pay for your seat, you're still able to fully enjoy the flight. And lastly, JFK itself. Now, a lot of people have JFK as kind of a nightmare as part of their travels. However, JetBlue has its own terminal here at JFK. Here in Terminal 5, it's pretty much only JetBlue flights. It used to share this terminal with Aer Lingus as well. However, those flights have moved. This means that if you're arriving on one of these international flights from London, Paris, and soon Amsterdam, the customs actually isn't all that bad, considering every flight that arrives is a narrow body aircraft, so there's not a whole lot of people queuing for customs, and because JetBlue doesn't have too many international flights as well, having only the flights from Europe and some from the Caribbean, it makes it so there's not that many flights at one given time that do have to check in. Unfortunately, what I will say is that for whatever reason, the bag check process still took forever, so it did take a little while for me to get out to the curb. All said and done though, by getting off the airplane, through immigration, getting my bag and getting out to the curb, the whole process took a little under 30 minutes. Fantastic for a flight from Paris to New York. So that's it. I welcome you guys to New York's John F. Kennedy Airport. We get dumped out here at Terminal 5 right at the historic TWA Hotel. If you haven't seen that, I am planning to potentially release a video covering that TWA Hotel soon. But in the meantime, I look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts on JetBlue's mint suites that they have on board their A321neos and what your thoughts are on the new rise of narrow body long haul services. In the meantime though, stay posted for more videos coming up every Sunday and until now and the next time, safe travels and I'll see y'all next time.